Um, so I have, I have a good little Mother's Day story for you. Um, oh, but before I do that, um, uh, Adam, let's bring up the lights so I can get a look at these good people here. Um, if you are a mother or you have held that place in anyone's life ever, uh, if you put mothering energy into the world, we would love to love you up and acknowledge you and wrap our spiritual arms around you. So if you would stand up and let us love you, mothers. <laughs> hey, happy Mother's Day to all of you. Yeah. It's a pretty important thing, you know. I, I think for all of us, mothers are probably our first spiritual teacher, you know, if you, if you think about it. Um, all right, so here's my little Mother's Day story. Uh, a friend, uh, Debbie's uh, two daughters, were in high school when uh, she herself experienced these severe flu-like symptoms. And so Debbie visited her family doctor who told her that the flu bug had passed her by. Uh, instead, she had been touched by the love bug, and actually she was pregnant. So, uh, the birth of Tommy, this wonderfully healthy, beautiful son, was an event for celebration. And as time went by, it seemed though every day uh, brought another reason to celebrate the gift of Tommy's life. He was sweet, he was thoughtful, he was a fun-loving uh, little guy and a joy to be around. So one day, Tommy was about mm, five years old or so, and he and Debbie are driving through to the neighborhood, through the neighborhood to a store or something, and... Uh, as in the way of children, out of nowhere, Tommy says, Mom, how old were you when I was born? And she goes, mm, 36, Tom, why? And she says, hmm, what a shame, he says. And she says, what do you mean, the mom inquires, more than a little puzzled. And looking at her with these love-filled eyes, this little boy says to her, just think of all those years, Mom, we didn't know each other. Oh, I just love that. I just think that's the greatest thing. So I'm talking this morning about the on-track consciousness. Now, Ernest Holmes said many years ago, Ernest being the founder of our church, he says, I want to be for something and against nothing. I like that idea, that I want to be for something and against nothing. And so I think that uh, if you participate in a spiritual teaching uh, of religion, uh, that religion is of the heart, and the heart moves us toward a greater, deeper religious spiritual experience. And I think, I think everybody is ripe for a big spiritual experience. I do. I do. We can use our consciousness in a positive way, or, and, and we all understand that, uh, because we have free will and we have choice. Uh, we can also use our consciousness in not such a positive way, but we're not going to talk about that right now. In the study of the science of mind, um, you know, our goal is always to be more conscious, more awake, more aware, more present, right, of what is true about God, and that also is true about us, because we teach God is not separate or apart from us in any way. So I believe it's good and right to be conscious about something specific. So this is where I like to talk about being definite with the infinite. A lot of people approach life and they just say, well, you know, I just want to go with the flow and take whatever comes, and, the, and they mean that right up until something rotten happens, right? Right up until something really terrible happens, they're like all about going with the flow and taking what life gives them and stuff. But the science of mind teaches us that our job as students of this practice is to be definite with the infinite. You don't just go to the grocery store and say, give me food. You don't go to the airport and say, give me a plane ticket somewhere. Right? We have to be specific about things. And this is also true about the energy of our intention, about where we're headed in life, about what we're trying to create about what we're seeking to manifest or how we're seeking to be in the world. You know, without being specific, we're not going to get there. So to be, uh, to be on track, I have to work on specific, specific ideas. Um, and I think that's how consciousness works. Consciousness moves forward incrementally with specific ideas. And for each of us, you know, how we interpret these ideas, I think, will be different. You know, everybody has a different idea of what love is. Everyone has a different idea of what health is. Everyone has a different idea of what creative expression is. Everyone has a different idea of what success or abundance is. Right? So we each have a different focus, I think, but we're all using the same principle. 
So um, old, uh, old concepts may now be obsolete for many of us, you know, that, because if we tell the truth, we have all grown. We are not stagnant as a spiritual being. If you look at your own life and say, gee, am I more conscious than I was six months ago or a year ago? The answer is probably yes. Do I feel even a little bit more loving, a little bit more patient, a little bit more compassionate than I was six months or a year ago? I'm sure the answer for all of us is yes. I've seen um, people doing well and on track in their lives, and, they're, and the thing we have to pay attention to is they're doing something that's contributing to doing well. You know, it's not just a fluke. You know, you know, but then what happens is people say, well, I'm doing well, I can let up on everything I'm doing, right? And so when they let up on everything that they're doing, they sometimes seem to experience a slump, right? Or what seems like a slump. And they say, well, the principle didn't work for me. Science of mind doesn't work. I just don't get it anymore. I say, you know, nothing has happened to the principle. The principle doesn't change. But, but I have seen that our relationship to it does. You know, it's so easy to be a little bit lazy when things are going well, isn't it? To just kind of take things for granted, like, oh, I can ease up. I don't have to pray. I don't have to meditate. I don't have to do my affirmations. I don't have to do all this spiritual work. Things are going pretty well. But when things are going well, we have to look and notice why things are going well. What are we contributing? What, what, what are we saying? What are we thinking? How are we being? Because, so I think we have to stay on track. You know, our inner life has to be a priority, right? The, the engine of a train has to be fed again and again and again. You can't just say, well, I meditated once a couple months ago. That should hold me for a long time. It's not going to do it. It's not going to do it. And why it's not going to do it is because life is happening all around us. We're constantly being bombarded you know, with, with thought forms. Mm -hmm. So I think our consciousness has to be fed. It has to be stimulated. And I think what we want to feed it with is we want to feed it with great ideas. We want to feed it with great possibilities. We want to feed it with ways that we can move forward in a healthy, a, a prosperous kind of way. Because life is constantly challenging us to develop and grow. Had you noticed that? You never get to sit in one place for too, too long. So I think we don't grow by always looking at where we were. Right? Because you can't drive a car exclusively looking in the rear view mirror, right? At some point, you're going to have to look forward, not just in the rear view. And we don't grow in life by exclusively looking at where we've been. We grow by new ideas. You know, uh, they, they fill and become a part of us and outflow into our, our experience of life. It, you know, it's impossible for great new ideas to come to us if we're just so completely satisfied and believing that we're doing all we can and I should just be happy with what is. No, no, they come to, the, great ideas seem to come to the busiest people. Isn't that how it goes, right? The, the most active people, you know, who know that they are always ready for the next step in consciousness, that's where great ideas show up. They're thinking beyond their current state. Right? Uh, um, in the Bible, there's a phrase that I used to really struggle with, and it was this, it says, unto him who hath, it shall be given. That seems so unfair to me. If you already hath, why are you the one being given? Right? But when I think about it now, I think, oh, it's not that God is favoring somebody who already has. It's a thing about consciousness. You know, because consciousness attracts more of what it is. So if you see yourself as somebody who has, uh, somebody has something to val of value to give, then the universe will give you more opportunities to give your value. If you are somebody who has love to give, the universe will bring people and situations into your life where you get to give your love into the world. Right? So, so it's really about consciousness. If you see yourself as somebody who lacks, well, that's what the universe is going to respond to. But if you see yourself as somebody who has value, then the universe says, yes, you have value and is going to open up doors for you to give that value. You know, you want something done. We, you know, the old saying is like, oh, if you want something done, who do you give it to? A busy person, right? We've all heard that, you know? But I think that, has, I think that part of that is that a busy person just knows how to keep moving forward, right? So I'm, I, I, I'm going, uh, let me say it like this. That in the science of mind, we teach that God, that spirit, that infinite intelligence, that divine consciousness is the very self of who we are. That's not an arrogant thing to say. It would be if we were saying it's only true about us and not true about anybody else. But the fact is, it's true about every single man, woman, and child on the face of the earth. So here, there are two guys who are sitting in a bar drinking. 
and drinking and drinking and drinking. And one turns to the other and says, you have got to stop drinking. Your face is getting blurred. Okay? Uh, uh, why I share that is because humanly we're trained to react to appearances, right? That, that Jesus had, even Jesus had the appearance of three, three temptations. But as time passes, I'm more convinced that it is the wisest and best idea to fix our attention on the good, right? The loving, the beautiful in life, and dwell as little as possible on the rest, right? Why? One reason is we become what we contemplate. What you focus on increases. You know, there are butterflies in nature that become the color of the foliage they settle on. I just think that's an extraordinary thing. What an incredible principle of intelligence that's operating through everything that even a butterfly develops in such a way that it can be completely hidden in the foliage. I mean, like, wow, there is some intelligence happening there. Things like worry and concern and resentment and gossip and all those other unproductive things never ultimately serve us. They just don't. They keep us small. They keep us from thriving. They hold us back. So we have to direct our minds in a positive manner. We really do. It is only in this way that we will rise above whatever the apparent limitations are in the world that we live in. So um, I don't know if you've read The Little Prince by St. Exupery. I loved that uh, years ago. I used to uh, really enjoy that book. And particularly, the art, I thought the artwork was stunning. But in, uh, he says, you give birth to that on which you fix your mind. There it is again. There's our teaching. That's the science of mind. You know, and, and like the children's story of the little train that could, another children's story, uh, progress depends on diligence and perseverance. I think I can. I think I can. I think I can. I know I can. I know I can. I know I can. Right? So if we're not getting the results we desire, I think we have to look at how we're viewing our life. That's, a, that's the first place to start. How am I viewing? What am I bringing to the seeing? You know, what's our basic perspective? How diligent are we in pursuing our current goals, whatever they may be? Now, I don't think God has any judgment on any goal you have. As long as it does not intentionally violate someone else's free will, God is for your greater expression in life. I absolutely believe that is true. So how diligent are we in pursuing what we say we want to have in our life? It doesn't have to be a tangible thing. It could be greater peace of mind. It could be a sense of uh, deeper communion and fellowship with your family and friends. You know? uh, so if you don't know, this would be a really good time to start thinking about where am I headed? What are my goals? What are, what are my big intentions at this point in my life? Because uh, I think what, and then I would ask myself, well, what talents can I build to assist in reaching those things that I say are important to me. You know, do, do we think our creativity is accelerating or do we think it's diminishing? Do we think the love in our life is expanding or do we think it's just frittering away? And on and on and on. I think, you know, I, what I ask myself is, you know, can I focus on what I need to do and let the extraneous distractions just pass by? Now, I know that's hard because, you know, distractions, I, look, I have shiny object syndrome as much as anybody. You know, I'll be going along doing what I'm doing and then I get distracted. You know, it's like when I take my dog for a walk and all of a sudden there's a squirrel. Oh, my, you know, we'll just be going along swimmingly, but then that squirrel will run up a tree and my dog just goes right up the tree, right behind the squirrel, forgetting that she's a dog, not a squirrel, and at some point falls back out of the tree. All right, so do we, do, do we know about ourselves, you know? Um, can we stay focused on our higher purposes in life, right? Because it's easy to major in the minors, you know, those little nit nit things that get on our nerves. It's easy to be so caught off guard or so taken up in those things that we don't do the bigger stuff that we came here to do. I know we all encounter seeming obstacles. I get it. Everybody experiences some adversity. But where will we focus when we do? When, when I experience that adversity, when I experience that obstacle or difficulty, where am I going to put my focus? You know, blame isn't it. I know that. We know better. It's not productive. It's not healing. So let's look for new evidence that we are doing better than we thought, that we are all, every person here is on the grow. And there's evidence in your life to prove it. Now, you may be the only one to know it, to see that evidence. 
because life is a creative endeavor. Every moment has a seed of opportunity. Every moment we live has a seed of, um, uh, great, of greatness within it. Right? Uh, so uh, in Chinese philosophy, Lao Tzu, in the Tao Te Ching, uh, some of his teachings reflect the effect of diligence and perseverance uh, and, and, and in the ripple effect of the Tao. So he says, do you want to be a positive influence in the world? So probably most of us do, right? Nobody gets up this morning and says, I'd like to be a negative influence in the world. No, I want to be a positive influence, a, 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 a force for good in the world I live in. He says, first get your own life in order. You know, ground yourself in the universal principles so that your behavior is wholesome and effective, right? So what this is about, I believe, is that we cannot give what we do not have. We can't show up as different than we really, really are. So I get my own life in order, right? And I behave in a more wholesome way, in a more effective way. And he says, if you do that, you will earn respect and be a powerful influence. So remember that your influence begins with you and ripples outward. Everything in our life starts where we are, and there are these ripples, like when you throw a, a stone into a pond. You know, so be sure your influence is both potent and wholesome. Yeah. So how, how do we know that this works? All growth, all growth spreads out from a fertile potential nucleus. Now, what I'm here to tell you today is that you are that nucleus. You are that nucleus in your life. You know? And so what makes that nucleus uh, fertile and potent is what we feed it, right? Our thinking, our believing, our affirming, our praying, all of that. Though another Chinese, uh, uh, little Chinese proverb says, even the tallest tower got started from the ground, right? So we're all working with the same kind of stuff. Every one of us is capable, I believe. You know, with perseverance, we will, we will make progress. We will complete our goals. We will achieve greater, greater things, you know? And on track, we will have higher self-esteem, We'll feel better about ourselves. We'll feel better about the people in our lives. We'll be happier. You know, we'll have a, a secure sense of, of productivity and creativity and being connected to the source of all good, which I think would be just a wonderful thing for all of us. Let's pray. So we turn our attention inward now for a moment, remembering that right here where we are, there is an infinite power, an infinite presence, an infinite principle, and we call it God. It's the living spirit almighty. It's the truth about each and every one of us. We are emanations of divine consciousness. And so therefore, all of the qualities and attributes that exist in the infinite mind exist in us here and now today. So I claim for each and every one of us great good that we are on track, that healing is happening in every area of our life. I also know for each and every one of us that we know where we're headed, that there's there's no honor in just going with the flow and having no direction. We're being definite with the infinite as we see where we're headed and we take steps in that very direction. So we include in our prayer today our family members, parents and children, all of those we love. And we say a particular special prayer for our mothers. Whether they're here on earth with us or they've moved on to the next dimension, I know that we're always in relationship that love never ends. And so we just, in our own way, take a moment to wish our mothers well and wish them love and peace on their journey. And now expand that circle so that you include anyone else in your life who's ever been mothering toward you. So it might have been an aunt or a grandmother, friends, friends, parents, whoever you've received that loving maternal energy from. Just be grateful for that now and wish those individuals absolute love and joy on their journey wherever they may be. And so now we come back to thinking about the world that we live in and we let our prayer be a blessing in our world, touching all people in all situations. We bless our church, we bless all churches everywhere, synagogues, temples, mosques, ashrams, all paths to God. And I'm certain that we are blessed by being together, that there is raising up, there is healing for all of us. And so with a full heart, I say, thank you, God, that this is the truth. I release this word, and so it is. Amen.